We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We'll say a very special welcome to Central from Keller ISD. Teachers, if you're watching and you're not signed up, please do so. Go to www.towny.cc slash high school restoration and sign up for us, please. Uh, the program today will be a program about aquatic organisms. During this virtual field trip, students will classify different aquatic organisms using tools such as dichotomous keys and compare and describe how adaptations allow an organism to exist within an aquatic environment. Uh, Mr. Mayors will cover dichotomous keys. Mr. Broughton will tell you all about frogs. Turtles by Mr. Dominguez and Ms. Ram will discuss fish. Uh, you cannot ask us a question during this program, but you can uh, write it down, www.tiny.cc slash question space answer. Send it in to us. I'll do my best to answer them during the program. And if not, I will uh, send the answers to your teachers and they can discuss it with you. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. My name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're going to be learning about how to use dichotomous keys. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys. And we'll do a quick little virtual trip of our pond so that we can try and identify some of these aquatic organisms. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. And we'll take a look at a really quick little video. So in this video, since y'all are not able to visit us, uh, this is actually a video of our pond that we used to have behind our building. However, it's been totally dry lately, so there's no water there. Uh, these are some aquatic organisms that I actually found using a microscope uh, to try and observe the water. So there you see a unique organism, a cyclops. Uh, here is the Daphnia. It's also called the water flea. I think they look really cute. They kind of swim erratically. Now, of course, um, I didn't know what these organisms were, but I had to utilize research and field guides and dichotomous keys to help me identify what these organisms are. So oftentimes scientists, biologists, uh, they have to use uh, available resources like dichotomous keys to help them identify unknown organisms. That interesting little sphere you see rotating around is called Volvix. Here's another one of our Cyclops. Again, it gets that name because it has what looks like a, one big eye. It's actually related to crustaceans. So think of like a shrimp. Uh, this one, I wasn't quite sure what it was even after all my research. It could be some sort of a paramecium or a euglenia. They are both a type of protist. But notice how its body shape is kind of elongated. It's motile, so it can move. So lots of things that are in the water, you might not see them at first, but once you take a closer look with a microscope, you'll start to see a whole bunch of other little things. Uh, this happens to be algae. There's another one of our little water fleas flying around. Uh, this one is some sort of uh, rotifer. And of course you can see those various ones. There's another um, water flea as well. So again, I had to use dichotomous keys and fill guides to help me identify some of those unique microscopic organisms that can be found in our ponds and lakes. Uh, so these are freshwater organisms. Uh, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna stop this video and we'll take a look at our slide presentation. So for our slide presentation, Let's move on. Uh, so for our slide presentation, we're gonna be talking about those dichotomous keys and how to use them. So you guys are probably familiar with a dichotomous key. You just probably might not know what it stands for. Uh, so if you guys, when I was in um, middle school and high school, we used to read like the 17 and Cosmo magazine and they would have something similar to this, kind of like a flow chart uh, where you would follow and it would tell you, you know, what kind of spirit animal you have or things like that. Those would be an example of a dichotomous key. Uh, so your uh, focus questions today, uh, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you should be able to identify what is the entomology of the word dichotomous and name two careers in which a dichotomous key is used. Um, also another example more relatable to you for dichotomous keys is if you've ever played that game 20 questions, um, that can be very similar to how a dichotomous key works. So let's look at what exactly dichotomous keys are. So dichotomous is Greek for divided or cut into two parts. So di means two. And it is simply a key for the identification of organisms based on a series of choices. 
Now, this is super interesting uh, because there are roughly two people who have been credited with uh, creating the dichotomous key. The first is John Baptiste Lamarck, um, and he, most people consider him the creator of the dichotomous key. He was a French naturalist, and he created the first text version of a dichotomous key for botany and microorganisms. So here's an example of his text version of a dichotomous key. However, there is an Englishman named Richard Waller, and he created the pictorial dichotomous key of herbs, which you see here on the bottom. And he created this one almost 100 years before John Baptiste created his textual version. Um, so there's kind of two people who are credited with creating the dichotomous key. And again, a dichotomous key is just a tool that is used to identify an unknown organism. So identifying organisms helps scientists understand an area's biodiversity and document those changes. So in our next one, we're going to practice using a dichotomous key to identify an unknown organism. So we're going to try and identify this little organism here. Uh, these are, can actually be found in our Texas ponds and lakes. So take a good moment to observe some of the characteristics of this organism. And we're going to try and use this key uh, to help us identify it. So this is a text form of a dichotomous key. Text forms of a key can either have yes or no questions or either or questions, but they will always have what are called go-to prompts. And the most important thing for you guys to remember is when you're trying to use a dichotomous key, you always start at question one. So we're going to start at question one. And there's always going to be two options for each step. So you're going to choose the option that best describes your organism and then continue to the indicated step. So again, we're going to start at question one. So we have two options. A says cilia are present. B says cilia, cilia are absent. Um, so you're going to take a look at your organism and you're going to see if it has cilia or if it does not. Now, sometimes if there's a word that you might not know in a dichotomous key, you might have to research or use an encyclopedia to help you understand what those words mean. So a cilia is just a short microscopic, they're hair-like structures. There's usually a lot of them. So if I look over here at our organism, I can tell that it doesn't have cilia. So it doesn't have a lot of those little hair-like structures that you might see in some organisms. So I'm gonna follow what it says. So we say that cilia are absent. We're gonna follow to the row and it tells us to do something. It tells us to go to question two. So now we're gonna to go to question two. Question two has two options. Are flagella present or are flagella absent? So take a look at our specimen over here. I clearly see a flagella. You can see it moving around. And again, a flagella is just um, usually a single or maybe two or three. It's a long thread-like appendage that kind of moves like a wave. So we can tell that this organism does have a flagella. So we're gonna follow along. If it has a flagella, it tells us to go to question four. So let's skip to question four. Question four has two options. Uh, does this organism have a single flagella or two or more? So let's take a look at our organism. We can see that it only has one single flagella. Uh, so we know uh, it tells us now to go to question five. So let's skip to five. Again, two options. Organism has chloroplast or organism lacks chloroplast. Again, chloroplasts are just, um, it's a plastid that contains chlorophyll to help with photosynthesis. And if we take a look at an organism, uh, we can tell that it does have a big green sac for that chloroplast. And so we can tell that this organism, it finally gives us a name, so it doesn't tell us to go anywhere else. We know that this organism is euglenia. Uh, so that's kind of a quick little overview of how to use it. Again, the most important one is you have to start at question one and then just follow the steps where it prompts you to go. There is another type and that's a flow chart form. And we're gonna quickly use uh, this flow chart to try and identify this interesting aquatic insect. Uh, so again, we're gonna start at the very top or question one. In this case, it's a flow chart. So we're gonna start at the very top. 
Our options are shells or no shells. Well, we can take a look at our organism. We can tell it has no shells. So we're gonna uh, go further down. Our next options are no legs or legs. Well, our organism obviously has legs. So now we're gonna see what our next two options are. And our next two options are, does it have 10 plus legs, four pairs of legs, or three pairs of legs? So if we look, we have one pair, two pair, three pair. So now we're just gonna follow along in the flow chart. Our next options are no wings or wings. Well, if we look at this bottom little video here, we can see that this guy can actually fly. So we know it has wings. Our next set of options are, are is it beetle-like with wings that are hard or does it have leathery wings? I know you guys aren't able to actually touch it, um, but I know that it has leathery wings. So then our next set of options would be to try and identify it based on this set of organisms. And by looking at it, oops, I did the wrong one. Uh, so I was gonna do the water scorpion earlier. <laughs> Sorry, this one is actually the giant water bug. It's this one right here. So it has grasping front legs and it's up to three inches long. So it's this guy right here. So other scientists actually use psychotomous keys too. There's botanists to help identify flowers. Um, arborists to identify trees, biologists for other animals, but not just those scientists. We have people like auto mechanics who might use a dichotomous key like this one to diagnose car trouble. Um, there's people who work in carpentry that might use a dichotomous key to identify different uh, screws and nails. Um, something relevant to us now is doctors and nurses might use a dichotomous key or flow chart form to help them decide whether a person has the flu, or the allergies or COVID. So lots of different people can use dichotomous keys. It's just a way to identify an organism or to identify something. And my challenge for you guys is to use uh, either the dichotomous key on the previous slide or use this below virtual dichotomous key to identify this unknown organism on the right. And there's a free app called Aquabugs that you guys can download for free. And it has uh, steps that it can take you to help you identify your unknown organisms. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys. We're going to give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. And a student asked a question. Can a dichotomous key have three choices? Dichotomous means divided into two parts. Hence, the dichotomous key always presents two choices based on the key characteristics of the organism in each step. And now Mr. Broughton is going to hop on the subject of frogs. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Uh, my name is Mark Broughton. I'm the, uh, going to teach you all about frogs, maybe with the assistance of Smokestack the rooster um, back there. Once he gets started, it's hard to get him to quiet down. So if you hear him going, um, we'll just have to work through it. But I'm going to take out a frog to show you here. This is an American bullfrog. Just give me one minute. <clears throat> And uh, this guy here is Hoppy Jr. It's an American bullfrog. And you can see he's got some really big eyes. That's one of the frog's adaptations that help him to see. And uh, these frogs can also retract their eyes into their heads to help them swallow their food when they eat. So the eyes help him see um, its prey and potential predators. But also, um, eat its food. And he's starting to kick a little bit here. So I'm going to try to show his webbed feet before he gets too anxious on me. And there you're getting a pretty good look at it. That's another adaptation of a, of a bullfrog. They have some really long legs and uh, the webbed feet that, that they use to uh, hop and swim. And uh, I'm going to put him down because he is not enjoying being held very much, but here's a, well, another good look at him and then I'm gonna let him go. Uh, while, I am... while I'm washing my hands off here, I'll tell you a little safety about if you're gonna work with live frogs and that is wash your hands before and after um, touching them because you can get germs on them 
but they can also give you uh, salmonella if you don't wash your hands really well after using them. So I washed my hands before I picked up Poppy Jr. there. And I'm gonna clean my hands off right now before I get into a uh, PowerPoint presentation on frogs. So let me uh, share my screen here. And here we go. So uh, frogs have lots of inter interesting adaptations. Uh, first are their legs, and we just saw Hoppy Jr.'s legs there. They have some very long and very powerful legs. Uh, if you look at a frog, they can generally jump 10 times their body length. So if you were six feet tall um, and you had the, the leg strength of a frog, you could jump 60 feet. So dunking a basketball would be super easy. Uh, you'd be the star of your track team for long jump and high jump. Um, you'd be able to you know, jump some amazing lengths and frogs um, do that. That's one of their adaptations. They also have those webbed feet that we saw. This one is not a bullfrog. This is a leopard frog, but lots of different frogs have webbed feet that help them swim in water because frogs are amphibians, which means they spend um, a significant part of their uh, life on land, but also in water. So if you ever see frogs, they're, they're probably near a water source. Um, not always. We're going to look at a couple um, exceptions to that rule, but generally frogs live near some type of water source like a lake or pond or river and that we their webbed feet help them swim in the water that they, that they live in. <laughs> they also have padded toes, not all frogs, but some frogs. This is a tree frog. Uh, we have these out here at our center and um, they're, they're gonna be found um, in and around trees, but also those trees are gonna be somewhere near a water source as well, because again, frogs being amphibians have to stay uh, near water, but you can see the pads on this frog's toes really help it to um, be able to climb reeds um, near a pond or, or branches or, um, or even sides of buildings. They can climb almost anything because of these sticky uh, padded toes. And then we back to their eyes again. Again, they've got those gigantic eyes on top of their head and their eyes can help them see forward, sideways and above them um, because sometimes birds are, are flying above and they have to watch out for potential predators. And again, those eyes can help them eat. They can actually retract those big eyes into their head to help push the food back down their throat after they've eaten it. And uh, when we get to another adaptation, you might see why it's important to use their eyes to swallow their food sometimes um, because of the things that they eat. And another thing with their eyes is that a lot of frogs have a transparent eyelid. So you can see this frog's here's eyelids about halfway up its eye, but that is a transparent eyelid. So even when their eyes are closed, they can still see. Just like us putting goggles on to swim underwater, they can see um, even when their eyes are closed and they, and they even rarely close their eyes because they, um, a lot of times we blink to help put moisture into our eyes. But if a frog is in water, of course it doesn't have to get moisture by blinking. It can just get moisture from the water that it's in. But even if it does close its eyes, it can see, so it'll, it can always be looking for prey and predators um, wherever it's at. And then of course, the frog's tongue is an important adaptation. Um, a frog's tongue is usually about one third the length of its body. So again, if you were six feet tall, your tongue, if it were like a frog's tongue would be about two feet long, which is way longer than it actually is. The frogs need that long sticky tongue to catch prey like that cricket there on that leaf, uh, which is one of the main ways that they do catch their prey is uh, shooting out that sticky tongue to catch whatever they need to catch. And one thing that I learned by doing some research on frogs recently is that they will eat insects and, and I knew that, but they eat all kinds of things, um, especially those big bullfrogs. Like this one here is eating a bird, but it its mouth, is huge compared to its head, which allows it to swallow large prey. So um, larger frogs like the bullfrog I just showed you can eat small birds, uh, small rodents like mice, uh, small snakes, and of course the insects. So they can eat even, even other frogs. They can eat all kinds of things because they've got that giant mouth to swallow down and they can retract their eyes to help push 
that animal back down their throat and into their body. Because that is quite a large meal, even for this frog here. But you can see he's, he's almost got that bird completely swallowed. And then their skin is another adaptation. Uh, being amphibians, uh, their skin is really important to them. I mean, our skin is important to us, but frogs uh, breathe through their skin and drink water through their skin. And if you think about two of the most important things that you do on a daily basis, one would be breathe. If you can't breathe, you would die. And the other one is drink water. You could maybe go a couple of days without water, but if you didn't drink any water, um, you would die. And frogs get um, the air, the oxygen that they need and water to drink through their skin, or they can. They can also breathe it through their mouth, but uh, if they need to breathe through their skin, they can do that. So their skin is very important. And skin is not just important for breathing and drinking water. It, of course, helps them blend in with their surroundings. It provides great camouflage in a pond. You can see this frog is hiding in a pond with a lot of duckweed floating in it. Um, but they can, they can camouflage lots of different ways to hide from their prey and predators in their natural habitat. And sometimes they will do the opposite with their skin. So um, a poisonous frog will sometimes have bright, like this one is bright yellow, but they can also be bright red or bright blue or bright red and blue. And that bright color is a warning coloration um, for predators to say, don't eat me because if you do, you'll get sick and maybe even die if you eat me because I'm poisonous. So sometimes they're not trying to hide, they're trying to stick out to let predators know to stay away. And then of course, uh, they have that croak that frogs could do, and that is another adaptation. Um, that helps them find a mate a lot of the time. And the last frog that I'm gonna show you um, has, a, has a pretty distinct croak. We're not gonna get to listen to it, but um, it's really important for that frog, frog, and I'll explain why when we get to that slide, but um, their croak helps them find mates. And that's an important adaptation for survival because of course, for the species to survive, um, the frogs will need to reproduce. And then I've got just a few interesting kind of extreme adaptations that I found with doing some research of frogs. This first one here is called the wood frog. It lives in Alaska and it can, um, you, as you know, it gets very cold in Alaska sometimes. And uh, this frog can freeze in the winter or maybe just, you know, like, Last year, we had that really cold week in February. This year, hopefully, we don't have a week like that. But if we did and we had wood frogs here, they would actually be able to survive that. They can freeze solid and look like this in this picture. You'd think this frog, could, there's no way it could survive. But when it thaws out, that frog will be just fine and be able to go about its life. So it is adapted to the cold and able to freeze and, and then thaw out and, and keep living. Um, the frogs that live here in Texas, will hibernate a lot of the times. They cannot freeze solid. Like if I took a Hoppy Jr. out and tried to put him in the freezer, that would not work out. He would, he would die because he's not a wood frog, but those can actually survive um, freezing cold temperatures. And then another one that uh, I think was very interesting is Darwin's frog. It uses its skin for camouflage and even mimicry. You can see like that pointed nose, it mimics a leaf and here's an offspring of it. Uh, a frog that just, or, you know, that became a, uh, from a, that ch changed from a tadpole to a frog, has that pointed nose to mimic leaves. But what this does is the male will actually hold the tadpoles in its mouth um, until they're bigger and then release them. So it protects the tadpoles for as long as it can until they get too big and then finally spits them out into the pond and lets them turn into frogs. But it gives them a much better chance to survive by getting to live in the, in the, uh, male's mouth for a while versus being left to the elements of the pond from the from the day they hatch his eggs. So that that's kind of a different um, adaptation that this frog has. And then this last one is probably my favorite. It is called the northern burrowing frog. It lives in a desert in Australia. And a lot of times if you think desert, you do not think frogs, but this frog actually does live in the desert. And how it survives is when it gets very dry, it will form a cocoon around its body and bury itself up to three feet deep in the mud. Um, 
and it can stay down there for up to two years before finally coming out. And there you can see what it looks like after it comes out, it's coming out of its little, they call this a cocoon that it made for itself. And uh, it, if it gets to be a little bit of a rainy time in the desert, that frog will climb out of the, out of the ground, but it, it somehow knows through instinct that it's got a very short time to be above ground. So it has to start croaking practically immediately, start jumping even after ha having basically been in a coma for two years to find a mate to uh, um, reproduce and lay, lay some eggs and have them change into tadpoles and have those tadpoles turn into frogs. And then those frogs be able to bury themselves in the mud before the, before the water dries up again, because that is a desert. So it all happens very quickly, but that's a pretty amazing adaptation that this frog has to survive in a desert environment. And if you'd like to see a video of that, you can um, push pause and type this out at YouTube and you can watch a whole video of this frog um, burrowing down and then emerging when it finally rains um, in, that, in that desert um, in Australia. So that is all I have about frogs for you this afternoon. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Broughton. And we did have a question. How long do bullfrogs live? In the wild, the bullfrogs will live between seven and 10 years. They live slightly longer if they're in captivity where they don't have to worry about something getting them or eating them or anything. And now Mr. Dominguez is gonna tell you about the turtles. Hey guys, it's Mr. Dominguez. And in this portion of your virtual field trip, we are going to be talking about turtles. We are going to focus on the adaptations that aquatic turtles have that help them thrive in aquatic ecosystems. Teddy here is hands down one of my favorite animals here at the center. I've had him since he was a hatchling. He is a red foot tortoise. Red foot tortoises are native to South America and are very much terrestrial organisms. That means that they live on land. He just isn't suited for water. So let's take a look at two reasons as to why he just wouldn't make it in an aquatic ecosystem. So his shell is very round. It's very, very bulky. It's not very streamlined. In fact, when I give him baths every week, I have to make sure that the water's pretty shallow. Uh, otherwise, he just sinks to the bottom and I just don't want him to drown. So his little feet are also very, very stumpy. So as you can see, he's got some pretty sharp claws that are perfect for digging and burrowing, but just wouldn't be very good for swimming. He wouldn't make it too far. We do have some aquatic turtles here at the center. So we're going to take a look at those and see different from tortoises and why they're better suited for aquatic life. So let's get started. Aquatic turtle is the yellow-bellied slider. These guys are native to the U.S. We also have some red-eared sliders that I'll show you later. But I can already see some differences in the shell. Unlike Teddy's dome-like shell, this shell is very flat and much more streamlined. So perfect for swimming. Uh, if you look at its feet, unlike Teddy's very stumpy elephant-like feet, these feet are perfect for swimming to help it live in water. Our next aquatic turtle is the common snapping turtle, and these guys are amazing. Uh, just like the yellow-bellied slider, they have pretty flat shells that are streamlined, perfect for swimming. They also have feet that are webbed, so like flippers. But I wanted to focus on this turtle's ability to stay underwater for prolonged periods of time. So how do they do that? Well, in the wild, these guys would be under the mud just waiting on their prey, and their eyes are actually a little bit more uh, upward. They face a little bit more towards the top of the head so they can see their prey like fish uh, and crustaceans or whatever swimming around. These guys are omnivores, so they'll also eat uh, plant material, so I'll feed this guy turnip greens and other dark leafy greens. But how do they stay underwater 
hidden uh, from sight for such a long time? Well, they actually have an adaptation that allows them to exchange gases uh, and also extract oxygen from their environment from their cloaca. Their cloaca is their rear end. So that's a pretty neat adaptation. All right, guys, so I wanted to take you guys on a little trip, well, a virtual trip down our museum area. I wanted to show you guys some of our radiard sliders. Uh, they are related to the yellow-bellied slider that I showed you guys earlier. And as you will see, they have very similar or identical features or adaptations that allow them to swim uh, and thrive in these aquatic environments. So as you can see, we have webbed feet again, and those shells are much flatter than Teddy's shell. The, remember that dome shape. But the last turtle I wanted to show you guys is in Ms. Shram's room. So we're gonna take a little trip down this museum area here. We're gonna make our way down to Ms. Shram's classroom and it's going to be a little bit of a surprise because she doesn't know that I'm coming. She's got her chickens out there. So we are by Ms. Shram's room now. It says, beware wild animals on the loose. And I bet that she's going to have her dogs in here and they're probably going to attack me. So let's see. Oop, there they go. Look at that. We got some basset hounds. They are definitely not built for swimming. They are very stocky, like uh, our red foot tortoise that we saw earlier. Uh, I now wanted to show you guys uh, this awesome mud turtle that Ms. Shram has. So this mud turtle uh, is also one of my favorite turtles that we have here at the center. Oop, I'm being attacked. So this is an aquatic turtle. And as you can see, it's got the same characteristics, the same adaptations that the other turtles had. And right behind the mud turtle, we have a, another yellow-bellied slider. It's much younger. But as you can see, streamlined shell and some flippers, some web feet. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this portion of your virtual field trip and learned a little something about aquatic turtles. I'll leave you guys with some footage of a snapping turtle doing what it does best, snapping. Thank you. And we have a question. What is the world's largest living turtle? Weighing in between 550 and 2,000 pounds with lengths of up to six feet, the leatherback is a big turtle. Leatherback sea turtles can be distinguished from other species of sea turtles by its lack of a hard shell or scales. Uh, we don't have to have any 2,000 pound turtles around here. Now, Miss Ram is going to tell you about fish. Hey, everybody, it's me, Miss Ram. And yes, I do have the basset hounds as well, but hopefully they don't start attacking me. Okay, so I'm so excited because I'm going to be talking all about fish and their adaptations. And I'm super excited because I have a lot of fish tanks and I could talk about fish for 300 years, but I won't because I know you have lives to live. So let's get started on fish adaptations. So at the end of my little segment, you will be able to compare and describe how adaptations allow an organism to exist in an aquatic environment. And those organisms are going to be fish. So today's focus questions are, how does the fish's shape or its form help it survive in its environment? And how do fish's gills help it survive in an aquatic environment? So first things first, fish classification. So I want to say there's 33,000 different types of fish. We are only gonna be talking about fish with fins. So if we're looking at the fish classifications, we have fin fish and shellfish. So shellfish includes crustaceans, arthropods, bivalves, cephalopods. So all the mollusks, all the snails, the octopus, all the sea slugs, crabs, all those things. So those are all shellfish. 
we are going to focus on fish with fins. So that includes saltwater fish and freshwater fish. My favorite are saltwater fish. So I'll probably have a lot of saltwater fish examples just because they're so brightly colored and some of their adaptations are absolutely bananas. So let's get going with fish form. So all fin fish have this basic fish form and it may look very different um, on each fish, but they do have these basic um, components. So of course, we're gonna look at a clownfish first um, because they're kind of an easy example where you can clearly see um, each part. So we've got the gills and obviously that's what helps them breathe. And we'll get to that in a minute. Then we have the pectoral fins. So those are the ones on the side. The dorsal fins, the ones on the top, you might have heard that with dolphins before, even the dolphins are not fish. Um, then caudal fins, that's the back. So like the tail, caudal fin is like the tail. The pelvic fin is underneath and it's like right under the tummy. So dorsals on the top, pelvic's on the bottom, pectorals on the side. And then the caudal fin, again, the tail. So those are the basic fish parts that all of these fin fish have. So let's see some differences. So if we want to split them into groups based on how they move, 85% um, of fish move by tail power. So they power their movements by their caudal fins and they steer with their pectoral fins. So there are very, very um, many fish, obviously different kinds and all different shapes and sizes that move this way, that power themselves with their tail. So on one end of the extreme is the eel. This one is called a snowflake eel. And you can see they have that long streamlined body. And basically their whole body is just one long caudal fin, right? So they really have um, evolved to not even have um, pectoral fins. They have that long dorsal fin on top and their entire body moves like a snake, um, but underwater. So if you've ever seen a snake kind of slither back and forth, that is how an eel swims. So really their body is just a whole big long tail, right? So that is one extreme. And then we have some fish in the middle. Uh, there is a tuna, there's a big tuna fish. So those are highly powered by their tails and then a salmon as well. And salmon, they swim upstream and do um, a lot of migrating. So they have to have a very strong tail to help them swim up river. And then the last example is, I think one of the cutest fish. Um, it is a saltwater fish and it is called a box fish. And you can probably guess why, because it is shaped like a box. It looks like a little cube and it is obviously on the other end of the spectrum from the eel. It's not very streamlined, but it does power its body by its tail. And then it uses those pectoral fins to kind of balance in the water and steer itself. And you can see those little blue fish um, next to it are just probably picking off little things from the fish. Um, so sometimes they travel along, but all right, let's look at the other 25%. So these fish, use their pectoral fins um, to uh, power themselves, and then they steer with their tail. Okay, so it's a little different. So they're powered by their front fins and their tail steers them. So it's just the opposite. Now, these fish, whoops, where will go? Ah, there we go. Okay, so these fish um, are more commonly found in open water. So salmon, tuna, when you think of like the really big fish, like sharks and um, all sorts of different fish that are mostly in open water, they're gonna have more tail power because they have to swim further, right? Then we have these smaller fish that usually live in shallow waters or in coral reef environments. And now some of those fish I showed you before are in the reef, but we all know that parts of the reef are shallow and parts of it have a drop off. If you've seen Finding Nemo, you've seen that before. So these fish stay close to kind of rocky areas or shallow areas. And so they need to have more control of their bodies and they're not gonna have to travel as fast. 
of force right after I say that, I'm gonna show you the um, RAS. So a RAS fish is actually really, really fast. I have one in my fish tank at home, not quite like this uh, smaller one, but RAS are like almost impossible to catch. Once you have one in your fish tank, it's like impossible to get them out. So <laughs> they are really fast. They're really agile. So they use their um, steering to take them in and out of rock and hunt their prey and also avoid others. So uh, an extreme of a fish that uses their pectoral fins would be the stingray. So all sorts of rays use their uh, pectoral fins, which almost kind of look like wings. So it almost looks like the birds kind of soaring through the sea. Um, but those are actually just highly adapted and evolved pectoral fins. And then of course their caudal fin would be their, um, their barbs and their stingers. So those are definitely a dramatic example. And then another extreme adaptation, we have the puffer fish. So puffer fish, of course, use their extreme body shape to defend themselves and warn off predators. And then um, probably one of my favorite fish ever, which I really want, but it's an expert care level and I'm not quite there because I'm not a marine biologist. Okay, so I'm not even close, honestly. But this is the orange spotted file fish and you can see their tiny long snouts. They feed off of really, really tiny microorganisms in um, the reef. So they have that really long snout and they eat and pick off of corals and other tiny little animals. So they need expert steering and expert, expert precision to be able to hunt down those little critters. All right, enough about these friends. So let's see how gills work. Gills allow fish to breathe underwater, right? So when they open their mouths, their gills close, right? Because they're breathing in. So they want their gills closed so they can bring the water in and get the oxygen out. And you can see that's what it looks like from the side. And then from the top, kind of like a little x-ray vision is the water going into the gills. Then they get the oxygen, filter out the water, the gills open. So it's kind of like their exhale, the water goes out and you'll see those gills. And then I've included some pictures of, uh, I believe the top one is a whale shark. And you can see those red gills. And then below is a tuna that's been caught and you can see those gills really opened up. So basically all it does is filter the oxygen and expel the rest of the water, just like how we would breathe air. Inhale, exhale. All right, so that is how the gills work. Then how do swim bladders work? So if you're ever wondering how they go up and down and how they don't just float all the time or how they can go deep down in the water, they ha um, fish have swim bladders. So the swim bladder looks like this. This is like the picture I could find that's the most clear and the least disgusting because oof. So this one is kind of showing how um, a swim bladder looks when it's inflated. So it kind of looks just like an oddly shaped um, balloon. So what they do is when the swim bladder expands, it fills with air and it increases in volume and places, displaces more water. So that increases the fish's buoyancy and it allows it to float upward. Same thing when it deflates, um, they are able to submerge themselves further. So you can kind of see this diagram on top. When it's inflated, it's helping them float up. And then when it's deflated, it helps them go down. So that's how swim bladders work. And if you've ever kept um, fancy goldfish. A lot of times goldfish are such messy eaters and a lot of um, people don't have proper care for their goldfish or proper aquariums and they get really dirty. Um, and so if the water gets dirty, the fish can often get um, a disease like swim bladder disease, which will cause the fish to float up. So it's a whole thing. And there are treatments for it, but we won't get into that because this is not goldfish care 101. All right, moving on. I told you I like fish too much. Okay, so strange adaptations. I found a few fish that I wanna share with you that have really, really strange adaptations. So everybody has gills, swim bladders, 
uh, fins and all that. But these fish really stand out as super strange adaptations. So the first one is an angler fish. They are super creepy and they have really, really evolved and adapted to their deep sea environment. So they live in parts of the ocean that are pitch black and completely dark. And they are called angler fish because they fish for other fish. So an angler is a fisherman and they use their antenna that lights up um, as a way to lure in their prey. So just like how people use little lures to catch fish, um, the angler fish does that as well. So they have that pretty little light. If, once again, if you've seen Finding Nemo, you know what I'm talking about. They have that pretty little light, the fish swims close and it's over. Next, we have the frogfish. These little guys are so cute and hilarious looking. Um, the frogfish use their leg-like fins. So their pectoral fins basically function as legs. So these little guys get their food um, scrounging through the sand and everything. So they use their leg-like fins as um, like to walk. So they basically use them as feet. So they walk across the ocean floor and you can see they make really funny facial expressions too. All right. Okay, I'm trying to scoot so I don't go over my time too hard, uh, too much. Okay, so strange adaptations, seahorses. Seahorses use their camouflage, they change color, and the shapes of their body vary greatly. Um, they also have those long snouts, just like the bile fish that help them eat their tiny little food. Um, and they are excellent at avoiding predators. So on the far left is a pygmy seahorse. And you can see it's totally evolved and adapted to its environment and matches the coral that it lives in almost perfectly, as well as the one on the far right, which is actually a leafy sea dragon. Um, but the leafy sea dragon lives amongst seaweed and it almost blends in perfectly with its environment too. Um, and then a classic seahorse in the middle. So the last one I wanted to show you is the flying fish. And so the flying fish, they don't actually fly but they do propel themselves out of the water and they use their wing-like pectoral fins to kind of stay above the water for just a little bit. So they're not actually flying, but they propel themselves out and that momentum keeps them going and they have their little wings <laughs> that kind of, well, their fins that look like wings that help them stay up for a little bit and they go under. Um, and they can move as fast as 50 miles per hour. I've seen different accounts, so you might want to double check that one. I've seen 35, I've seen 40, I've seen 50. So um, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say they're the fastest at 50 miles per hour. But they actually do this, because I was wondering why on earth would they do this? They do this to escape predators. So they're propelling themselves out to get away from their larger predators underneath. And hopefully they're fast enough to get it. So I'm gonna stop sharing this. And I did wanna show you a few things. So obviously a bit of adaptation that sharks have is there are many, 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 many rows of shark teeth, sharp teeth, <laughs> okay? So if you can see the inside, you can see all the rows of those really, really sharp teeth because they are predators and they eat a lot of smaller fish. They obviously have those sharp teeth. And then I have a little dried puffer fish specimen. It's kind of yucky, kind of sad, but you can see how they really use their um, body shape and their spines to uh, escape from predators. And then lastly, I just have a um, real seahorse specimen to show you. And you can see it's dorsal fin and all of that. So oh wait, hopefully you can see it. Okay, so I'm gonna let you go. I'm out of time. I can't wait to see you next time and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Ms. Ram. And a student asked a question. What are the most common type of fish in the world? Well, the four most common type of fish, the grass carp, the Peruvian anchoveta, the silver carp, and the common carp. And now I am going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students classify different aquatic organisms using tools such as the dichotomous keys and compared and described how adaptations allow an organism to exist within an aquatic uh, environment. Uh, Ms. Ramirez covered the dichotomous keys. Mr. Broughton told you about Hoppy and the rest of the frogs. 
Mr. Dominguez, the turtles, and Miss Ram just covered the, uh, the fish with you. Uh, some beautiful, beautiful creatures all throughout the program. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you would, teachers, go to www.tiny.cc slash hsfeedback. Fill out a very short form and send it back to us. We would appreciate it. You guys have a great rest of the day. More importantly, have a great rest of your life.